Uh, my name is Michael Schatz, and I'm here on behalf of the JXDX Foundation for Open Science. Uh, three years ago, at the beginning of the pandemic, we lost a, ben a dear friend and colleague. Uh, James Taylor was a core member of the genome informatics community, including serving as conference organizer from 2011 through 2013. I'm sure he'd be sitting right here in the front row if he was with us today. Uh, James is best known for founding Galaxy, and I'm sure that many of you uh, in the room here got started in genomics either using Galaxy or have been aware of it and seen it in action in some way. Uh, by many metrics, Galaxy is the most advanced platform for data intensive research and teaching, and to date has supported more than half a million users uh, worldwide. Uh, beyond Galaxy, one of the most important and lasting contributions of James was his passionate commitment to open, reproducible, and accessible science. He was always the one in the room demanding that the data and the tools uh, were openly available and not just available upon request. He was also the one to advocate that researchers from every institution, the big ones and the small ones, would have equal access to data, tools, and to resources so that everyone had a chance to participate. He was a community builder and he was a deep friend. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about James and miss his presence. Uh, to, to honor James, uh, Anton Nurchenko, myself, and a few others have founded a foundation, the GXDX Foundation, to ensure that his legacy continues into the next generation. Our mission is to support open, reproducible, and accessible science. Uh, to get started, we have been focusing on supporting students, uh, postdocs, and other early career researchers as they launch their careers. Uh, one of the key activities is to create a mentoring network to connect early career researchers with other experts, editors, funders, and mentors to help navigate the first papers, the first grants, to really get their, their really the research going. Uh, for example, earlier today we had a really excellent panel uh, with Sergio Sen and Sean Eddy you know, discussing kind of that grant submission, and I really thank them for their contributions. Another major goal is to support early career researchers to attend conferences. I think we can all agree that there's something really magical about being in the room together to share our science and share all of our ideas. Uh, to date, we have awarded 32 conference uh, scholarships, focusing on those conferences that James was most passionate about, was most involved in. The selection process is extremely competitive, and we look, <laughs> and we look um, at both the science and the commitment uh, to open uh, both at the science and also the commitment to open science. Uh, we look at your GitHub history as much as we look at the science that you're presenting. Uh, the scholarships are highly prestigious and signify that you are poised for transformative open science in the many years to come, and it's really a great honor to introduce uh, this year's awardees. Hopefully we can get the slide up here any second. <laughs> Uh, but if you're in the room, maybe you could uh, stand and be acknowledged as I kind of read through the list here. So first is Guano Yen from UCLA. Excellent. <laughs> Next is Yurana uh, Nawaz from the University of Adelaide in Australia. I saw her earlier today. Uh, next up is uh, Pulavi Surana from Stony Brook University. <laughs> next is Karen Isaev uh, from Columbia. <laughs> next is Rangting Huang from the University of Hong Kong. And finally, we have Jacob uh, Shintwak from the University of California at Berkeley. It's really excellent um, abstracts. I've met with many of them, seen their posters. I really encourage you to do it. It's really outstanding work. Our next opportunity for scholarships will be for biology genomes back here at Cold Spring Harbor this May. Uh, the application portal uh, for that will uh, open on January 1st. Please help spread the word. We're moving into a multi-platform multi, uh, social media stance, <laughs> so look for us on Blue Sky and LinkedIn and Mastodon and everywhere else. Uh, we hope that we can find uh, and cast a really wide net. Finally, if you're in a position to do so, please con consider donating to the foundation in James's honor. 
Our funding campaign right now is focused on endowing these scholarships so that we can offer them in, per in perpetuity. The foundation is a registered 501c nonprofit, so any donations you make uh, can provide a tax benefit back to you. Thank you very much for your time and your attention, and congratulations to all the wordies. It's really a great honor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And uh, without further ado, it's my um, really great honor to welcome our second keynote speaker, Karen Meager, who is coming from um, UCSC, where she holds a professorship in the Biomedical and Engineering Department, and she's also the director of the UCSC Genomes Institute. So, Karen, thank you very much for coming, and the stage is yours. Uh, maybe I'm trying to get you mic'd up. Try again. Oh, wonderful. Okay, good. Thank you very much for your patience as I get set up. It was a wonderful introduction to give a keynote. Um, I, it made me think about one of my first genome informatic meetings where I actually got to meet James Taylor, and I felt like that was one of the most influential genome informatic conferences of my career. It really brought me into scope of thinking about the importance of open data sharing and democratizing science. Another genome informatics meeting I came to was when I was a graduate student, and I actually found my postdoc lab here. This has been a healthy and a wonderful community for many years, and it's definitely shaped mine, and I'm so honored to be invited to give a keynote, so thank you. As mentioned today, I'm going to focus on complete genomes. This is really building from a lot of the enthusiasm and, and gains that we've had in the telomere to telomere consortium and the human pan genome reference consortium. However, today I'm going to have a little bit of a vignette or a story that's focused on how to study T to T genomes in the context of inheritance or in multi generational pedigrees. Hopefully, there we go. So I hope we all can once again gain the enthusiasm of having complete genomes, not only for the technical challenge of reaching a complete reference genome, but because by having this more complete map, we have the ability to study corners of our genome and new biology and new discoveries that just simply weren't there before. We can now look comprehensively end to end for variants. We can expand with long reads our, our understanding of epigenetics and long read RNA transcriptomes in the human genome as many other genomes as well, as we've taken this technology now outside of humans. And over a very short amount of time, we've seen rapid improvements and optimization, not only in the long read sequencing technology that's fueling a lot of this progress, but also in the T2T assembly space. If we take a step back to our modest beginnings, perhaps back in two, you know, 2020, when we released the first XT2T chromosome, that really felt like a Herculean effort. However, we've continuously seen this march of technology, where the next one was an effectively haploid genome. This was CHM13, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with in the audience, which took a, a genome with, which was derived from a complete hydrophilic mole and had its first kind of complete human reference genome um, release. Of course, following that, we had a celebration of the first diploid genome. This is once again putting a spotlight on um, Adam Phillippe's team, who's been leading the Q100 project, who released our first diploid T2T HE002 um, recently, and so that's been a, a really stunning announcement as well. My day job and the hat I typically wear now is focused on how do we take these emerging technologies and begin to pull them into production so that we can not only think about one reference genome or two reference genomes, but hundreds if not thousands of reference genomes that represent diverse human haplotypes. And once again, this is in partnership with the Telomere to Telomere Consortium and the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium. There's already been references to the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium at this conference already, but I think it's really important to use a slide to just really emphasize the goal. Here, we're trying to reboot the human reference genome. So therefore, you're not looking at a linear reference, may it be HD38 or CHM13 or any human reference that would be linear, but rather you're taking in a collection 
of 1,000 human haplotypes that represent global genetic and genomic diversity. In doing so, you're trying to eliminate or uh, lower or lessen genetic biases that we might see if we're mapping genomes that don't have a shared haplotype with the one reference that you're using. And this is meant to be a foundation for precision medicine and for new discoveries as we march into the future. One thing that really sets our team apart is from day one, even before we even had a published T2T X chromosome, our team was pushing to have T2T chromosomes be the new standard. So throughout the work that we're doing, we really emphasize the need to have the highest quality, base level accurate assemblies to motivate and serve as the foundation for science to move forward. Now, a lot of the advancements that we've been seeing recently have been coming, as I mentioned, fast and furious, and this is really in an exciting space of how to get to diploid T to T assemblies. Here, the HPRC has been collectively working with leaders in the field. I'm highlighting two here. This is um, work from Adam Phillippe's team, as well as um, um, Hang Lee, where we were able to use both Verco as well as HiFiism ONT to go through and begin to look at how to construct aut automated T to T, near T to T diploid assemblies, and I'll get to that in a moment. Both methods are really important for us to understand that it's not really building off of one single technology at the moment. We're actually utilizing a combination of technologies, both the use of a high accurate read, it could be mid-length read, such as PacBio HiFi, which has already been introduced, as well as the ultra-long nanopore data, which has also been discussed at this conference. These reads can extend to 100 kilobases and all the way out to these whales that are celebrated that could be a megabase plus. Now, it's, we're also finding that there's an important component to these T2T assemblies that's also taking an Illumina-based sequencing, and this could be using information from the parents to have trio-based phasing, as well as utilizing high c data, to, or strand seq for that matter, to identify phased haplotypes. Now, the human pan-genome effort, we've been trying to do this on scale. And so when we started, we had a number of different sequencing production centers I'm showing you on the map, multiple centers that were generating HiFi sequencing as well as ONT, and then we have a centers that generate our HiC data as well. In total, our combination, when we landed for the publication that I'm highlighting here by Jarvis et al. back in 2022, was at 30 to 40x HiFi coverage, 30x of 100 KB plus, which means we sequence ONT and only talking about the coverage of the reads that are 100 KB or higher, and then Illumina data sets that are 60x coverage. And when we utilize the two different methods that I was talking with you about, the HiFiism ONT, which is at version 0.19, or Verco, which was at the 1.31 phase, what we were seeing is that right out of the, out of the assembly, um, we were able to see, on average, about um, you know, closer to 12, 12 to 15 of these T to T chromosome contexts. Now, when I say this, what we're saying is we get a a chromosome scale end-to-end, -end, telomere to telomere, one contig. When you map it to CHM13, it's about the same size. However, I do want to put it as a candidate because we haven't gone through the excessive QC that would make us understand that it is as accurate as we like to call true T to T chromosomes. Additionally, we go through and check the quality, and I want you to see, once again, these two assembly methods are really performing in a compatible way where we're seeing this lovely QV value by YAC at about 50, 57. And each of these dots, as I'm trying to indicate on the slide, is, is one human genome. So we're doing this as kind of a benchmark study before we launch. Of course, there's a problem here. And the problem is that what we want is we want to scale to thousands of, of haplotypes at the same quality of what we're doing with the gold standard. And I would consider the gold standard at the moment to be this HG002 genome, um, once again, for the Q100 project where we know at the moment we might be uh, around a QV value of about 75, but pushing towards a QV goal of having 100. In this case, um, by having um, a, uh, the automated methods I just talked about, what I'm showing you here is just a smattering of these chromosomes are coming out T to T at the moment. And the question is, can we do better? Can we start to think about how to automate, change our sequencing platform? How can we start to do this in a way to make this a new standard in terms of quality of assembly? So to really start thinking about how to do this in a way that's somewhat off scope of what we've done with the T2T consortium in the past, we teamed up with some researchers at Washington um, University in St. Louis. Here I'm highlighting Nathan Snitchell, Bob Fulton, and Ting Wang, who were involved in a separate recruitment study. And they were able to recruit a three-generational pedigree of individuals who had population descriptors or self-identified as being African-American. 
these individuals were properly consented to have a broad consent and open data sharing. So this was really a, a lovely opportunity, once again, to generate TFT genomes and provide them to the community as an open resource. These T2T genomes, once again, would serve as offering better science. So once we have these genomes, we can begin to ask questions in the context of a pedigree that perhaps we wouldn't have within the context of just one genome alone. And then, of course, these all have matched resources. Every member of this three-generational pedigree has an LCL that you can order from Coriel. They were also properly consented for human iPSCs, and they're going to have iPSC um, cell lines will be available in Biobank for further study. And so in total, this effort is really building this fantastic resource that we're hoping will begin to drive new questions about how to utilize T2T genomes in the spaces that are being newly introduced. So this was an opportunity for us, an opportunity where we thought we could study new genome biology. Can we begin to look at T2T genomes and confidently study inheritance patterns over DNA that we know is typically complex? These highly repetitive DNAs at short reads typically cannot go into this space. Um, maybe the segmental duplications, the RDNAs, the acrocentrics. And can we also begin to use complete genomes to really model how to identify shared haplotypes, annotate sites of meiotic recombination? And this kind of moves us into a world of where we actually might be in the next 10 years, where if your own, <laughs> I guess your own family one day may have T to T genomes, and we may in fact operate in a space where we're starting to think about clinical diagnostics in the context of these types of family pedigree structures where you have these T to T genomes to provide that context and information. So we started off with generating HIFI data from blood. Um, and that's what I'm trying to show you here. Once again, in the blown up box, this is really emphasizing with the HPRC. Once again, our standard protocol for year one and year two was aiming for a level of about 35x coverage of the HIFI data. However, for the daughter, as I'm showing you in the middle, we actually went up to about 70 or twice that amount of coverage for both blood and for the established LCL cell line. This provides a really nice opportunity for us to begin to test what the difference may be if you're working, for example, from DNA that's derived from blood versus LCL. And it's one of the few examples we have now where you actually have that type of compa careful comparison from the same individual. Overall, we collected a lot of data so far. Um, for the grandmother, grandfather, mother, and granddaughter, as I mentioned already, we have a tremendous amount of HIFI as well as a small amount of um, Illumina data derived from blood. However, we also collected about 70x coverage. It's 100 KB plus. Once again, that's over half, twice as much as what we have for the HPRC, where we're typically around 30x coverage for the ONT data. We also included two other ONT data substrates. I don't know if it has been mentioned yet, but I'll go over them briefly. Um, one is called duplex DNA, where we were able to, based on being early adopters in, in my lab, bring in duplex data for each one of these individuals. We also were working with a long read, high C component, so we have poor C data for all of the individuals, in addition to high coverage, high C, in the order of aiming for about 60x coverage, but you can see in some cases we have 100x coverage, and just cell line Illumina to help us with our QC. So I don't think duplex has been introduced yet, so I'll take a moment just to go through it. Um, everyone, I think, in the room is quite comfortable with nanopore, and, but the idea of duplex is kind of intuitive. It's the idea, kind of like what we used to have with 2D um, nanopores, that you have one read that goes through and the second strand follows after. And by having both information for the strands, you can take the consensus and reach a really nice, high-quality um, consensus-based read or duplex read. Um, here you can kind of see the plot for one of the data sets that we're working with for the daughter's DNA. And we do do a couple of filters before we utilize these reads. And we do make sure the quality scores are at least 30. Um, and we also have a read length threshold of at least 15 kb. Might be difficult to see, but hopefully your eyes can adjust with the read lengths that we do find reads that go all the way out to over 100 kilobases in length, even though we are shearing our DNA um, for duplex to increase the efficiency of throughput. And I should mention as well that there's a real advantage for thinking about duplex and hi-fi together, and that was what we were actually trying to test. We knew that hi-fi had a, I can go back to make that point. 
Um, we knew that HiFi had GA dropouts and certain things, like all sequencing technologies had their own sequencing biases. And our early experiments with HD002, we noted that Duplex also had its own biases, but they might be different sequence biases. And so when put together, we were hoping that perhaps that could take us a little bit further in terms of trying to patch some more difficult regions that are often leading to these breaks in chromosomes. So in addition to the duplex data, we are also bringing in an exciting new data set known as PORC. This is um, also kind of the same concept of how people are building their chromatin capture or high c based experiments. However, instead of only doing pairwise-based sequencing on Illumina, you're able to actually sequence the longer multi-contact sequence. These longer sequences are expected to improve mapping to repeat regions, which is some of the most difficult places left for phasing. Namely, if you want to link into something like the acrocentric short arms. They also provide information on multiple contacts. So you're not just getting kind of two distances. You're getting kind of where that contact happened to touch multiple sites in the genome. And that could be important for helping us to understand interesting biology on top of the assembly efforts. In addition, it carries DNA modifications. Like all of the ONT data, when it travels through the pore, you can begin to make predictions on CPG and 5-HMC. And we knew that PORC was already adopted with module um, tools to extend phasing with the use of Verico. This was through software that was de developed called GeoPhase, and the bioarchive is there if anyone's interested in, in looking it up or using that particular tool. So when we ran Verico, and this one once again bringing some notice to the raise and, and version, we're at 1.41 now, um, and we utilized our data sets using 70x HiFi, 20x Duplex, 70x of our ONT data, and now 56 of our Illumina High c What we were finding is that we were able to, unlike previous with HPRC data, we were able to actually identify 34 of these T to T chromosomes right outside of, of assembly. And this was incredibly powerful in the sense of thinking that this would, could be a direction that we can move a little bit further in terms of thinking about how can we start to do this more readily for the other HPRC genomes too. We didn't run that assembly once. We, of course, continue to take different sampling of data types and also different assembly methods. We've, we ran HiFi as a MONT. We've run different combinations of sequences. But today, I just really want to show you using um, an experiment where we excluded the use of duplex and only used HiFi. So this is our 70x HiFi, 70x ONT match data coverage, and our Illumina High c And what we were finding here is that we had relatively the same amount. We had, we had more uh, T to T chromosomes in the duplex um, plus HiFi. But in this case, we could begin to think about identifying places, as I mentioned before, where some chromosomes were being finished and or were reaching T to T contig candidate level, and others were not. And that's what I'm trying to highlight in this slide. For example, if you only used HiFi data and you generated your assemblies, you would find, for example, you would have two candidates I'm showing in gray for chromosome one. These are both T to T contig candidates. They are the appropriate size, and they both end with telomeres on their end. However, if you did the same exercise with duplex, we'd find you'd only get one chromosome one. And so even though that they are different assemblies, we could then go through an exercise where we could identify, pick and choose, and create kind of a hybrid genome, which would have the highest number of TAT assemblies. Hopefully you can appreciate that this is kind of cost effective in the sense we've already paid the money for sequencing. This is just trying to figure out how to create the correct composition of sequencing and assembly tools to create uh, a more complete um, assembly auto and in a more automated way than having to go through. We consider this kind of self-healing um, in addition to swapping out entire chromosomes, we're exploring how to do patching on the T to T chromosomes as well. In other words, if there's some um, quality that would be changed by taking in a giant chromosome one that might not be um, compatible with the rest of the genome, and I'll talk about polishing in a second. We could go through and just identify that small change that needs to be implemented to, to wound heal or to create that break, and that's something that we're testing as well. Of course, the big problem here is not these uh, chromosome 1 or 4 or 16 and 17, which are the only remaining chromosomes that we had to worry with outside of the acrocentrics. It really is these very gnarly, highly repetitive acrocentric chromosomes. And one of the major regions, reasons that we have a, a difficult time reaching T to T's is because they have massive, sometimes 6 to, to 7 megabases of ribosomal DNA arrays that exist within the acrocentrics. And I'm sure many of us are used to seeing bandage plots. Hopefully your eyes can see up as well. You see this kind of collection or a ball, which is almost like a ball of yarn. These are all the RDNAs that are really collapsed 
in one location with all of the assemblies extending out from the acrocentric. So this is a really big challenge. Um, I'm just trying to show you here, that once again, that there are some chromosomes, like chromosome 15 and chromosome 21, that we were able to reach T to T contig assemblies. And when we asked ourselves why, we instantly started to team up with experimentalists who would take these particular cell lines, once again, this is a joy of having matched cell lines for these individuals, and took them into the lab and started to perform fish experiments. Here I'm showing you the grandfather, grandmother, mother, and granddaughter. I'm showing you their chromosomes, stained in blue, of course, by DNA. If you see flecks of red, these are chromosome markers, so we can tell which of the acrocentrics are which. And then we have them positioned for you to where in green you can begin to see where the RDNAs are. And you can start to look at the density of these different signals to give you some indication of copy number. Of course, we didn't only do copy number by this type of um, um, type of hybridization, we went through with KMERS and also performed a KMER-based assessment and tried to indicate, as you're seeing in the table here, an estimate of how many copies of each of the RDNA units are on each of the chromosomes. And things like chromosome 13, one of the haplotypes, for example, could have 5.7 megabases or 135 copies of this 42 base pair repeat, or 42 kilobase repeat. And then examples like 15, the one that I was trying to bring to your attention on the previous slide, which we actually were able to reach a T to T candidate chromosome, has no detectable RDNA by KMERS and no detectable RNA, as you probably see on the slide, by FISH either. And so this was a very interesting finding for us. We found um, multiple, for example, if you look at chromosome 21, there's one haplotype which does not have, once again, any detectable levels of RDNA either by KMERS or by FISH. And we can begin to, once again, see that's inherited within the mother. So there's two chromosomes that don't have that barrier of RDNA that we were able to traverse. Right now, we're going through and we're taking these assemblies and we're aligning them um, across and showing that they, are, of course, support each other and they have the same organization in those assemblies. And we're carefully annotating these sites now um, within the T2T consortium to make sure that they actually are correct and we are, you know, what, what exactly lives in these regions in the absence of RDNAs. However, that's not the story for all of these acrocentrics, and it definitely won't be the story for acrocentrics when we start to think about how we can scale this up to take in diverse haplotypes. And so right now, we've implemented a number of, of sequencing technologies I mentioned before, having high coverage, high C, poor C, and strand seq in an attempt to improve these assemblies. We have, for example, eight arms um, that need to be patched, and fortunately, thank you, I should send a gift back at, package to those who developed Verco, um, we have eight assemblies in our unplaced that end with telomeres, and so we're hoping that this will be a wonderful exercise where we can begin to utilize these types of linked um, information, such as high C, poor C, or strand seq, to begin to link these contigs together. We will not likely be able to assemble across the RDNAs with the technology we have now, maybe when there's longer, more accurate simplex ONT data or longer, more accurate PEC bio data, this will become a reality. So in the meantime, what we're doing is similar to the HD0, um, HD002 Q100 project is we're actually taking the estimate of how many RDNAs we expect to be at each site and putting in this placeholder for now and keeping as much of that natural information about the RDNA, of which we have up to 400 kilobases of information on either side, kind of maintained for researchers to study. And I should mention, in, as I'm trying to really highlight here, of course we have a wonderful session tomorrow that's really going to be focused on assembly, and you should definitely show up because I think Dimitri's going to give a wonderful talk that will include some of this new um, technology as well as moving into high C phasing. Now, I've been spending a lot of my time thinking about how we can utilize a, a lot of high-quality data to generate the best assemblies possible, but I'm not just trying to do it, or I guess I said uh, my team is not trying to do it just for one genome, but for the whole pedigree. And so here I'm trying to give you a feel for how we're performing across the whole pedigree. In green, I want your eyes to, I guess, adjust and assume that those are all our T to T candidate chromosomes for the grandmother, grandfather, daughter, and granddaughter. And I have the table substructured for you so that you can see the different haplotypes, one versus two. If you're seeing any um, flecks of yellow, what that means is that we have another assembly where there is a T to T candidate chromosome that would just be able to go in and take a place to augment or create a hybrid assembly to improve that assembly. If you're seeing light green, that means that we have a break, that we can't naturally sub 
any of the chromosomes that are already intact using another assembly method, so that kind of sub in a whole chromosome won't work. However, there's still methods to go through and try to do the patch repair and broken assemblies, but the place that's broken is not shared because of the different technologies, and we're actively exploring that space now. Of course, most of the errors that you're seeing or errors or the places that need the most attention are absolutely what we would expect, and these are the areas that map to the acrocentrics. And once again, this is taking us into new tech spaces of how can we begin to do this in a more automated way. Now, once you have these assemblies, there's a lot of really cool things you can begin to do with them. One is just by generating assembly alignments across the pedigree. You get a lot of new information. Of course, um, one element of this is that when you align the different assemblies, as I'm trying to show you here, in blue, these would be shared haplotypes, which I'm trying to star for you here, on both all the way across to have a shared blue haplotype as they're inherited down from the grandmother, daughter, and proband, or the granddaughter. And if you were to look at one particular site, you might find that there's a series of Ts, but then you all of a sudden have an A. And what we're doing with the pedigree now is we're using this as kind of a, a nice way to identify areas that could flag potential errors, or they could flag potential de novos. So we can kind of, throughout this process, begin to generate these types of really nice VCFs, where we can begin to identify areas that we really need to focus on as a, as a team. We've also teamed up with um, Rebecca and Tobias Marshall to think about how we can do haplotype resolved assemblies of these multi-generational pedigree graphs. And in doing so, we've tried a different strategy than what I've talked about before. This is um, an effort that they're performing to pull both the, R, the hi fi and the ONTs from the grandmother, grandfather, and mother, um, and try to build a Virco assembly utilizing this kind of joint um, union of the data sets. In doing so, there's an opportunity to build Kamer profiles and count Kamers in the HiFi reads of all the different family members, and then sample specific Kamers to identify phases that yield these initial haplotype blocks. And then by threading the haplotype blocks through the graph, we can begin to look at these scaffold and haplotypes. And this method is really wonderful in the sense that it allows us to see these types of family haplotype structures emerge, but it also allows us to begin to predict these types of meiotic recombinational breakpoints that gives us more insight to how the, the chromosomes are actually inherited and transmitted. Once we have these assemblies, we're really pushing to see how high quality they can get. Of course, polishing, much like variant calling, like the session we just had, um, is something that we think a lot about, about taking a reference, any reference. In this case, it would be our, our pedigree genomes, and then you would take the reads and you would realign them. And then, much like that, you would begin to call variants that you know, are not matching your reference. In this case, the example I'm giving is a G to A, and you, then you can replace that edit in the assembly. Of course, these current methods have very simplified statistical models and heuristic approaches, and they can't model complexity of the errors that are typically found to be um, residual in these T to T genomes, things that involve low complexity repeats and also error processes that sometimes are specific to the different technologies. There's also a repurposing of variant colors, so there's trained and classified to genotype and not necessarily to predict um, sequence errors. To address this, uh, we have formally partnered with Google Health to develop a new polisher known as Deep Polisher. It uses an encoder-only transformer for sequence prediction. What you're looking at here at the top is a, a haplotype assembly where we're taking hi-fi reads and aligning these reads and having now a phased read alignment over the different haplotypes. You can then take a 100 base pair window, and you can take that information within the 100 base pair window into a tensor, as I'm showing you here. And all of the, that tensor gives you base information, mi uh, match, mismatch, base quality, as well as mapping quality. You can take that information and form an encoder-only transformer, where the output is the VCF file, and then you can use this VCF tools consensus to go through and polish the assembly. This is something that we're working with the HE002 Q100 team now to do a lot of training with assembly and, and go ahead and take these variant train sets as, as a truth set. And so this is very active in, in the space. However, we're starting to see some really nice outcomes from using this polisher already. Deep polisher, we know, reduces the assembly errors in half. These are looking at the HG002 gene and bottle errors. On the top in the light green, I'm showing you the single nucleotide polymorphisms. On the bottom, we're looking at endos. Um, and if we look at the deep polisher in the space of SNPs versus endos, we see that it actually does a much better job in, in performance in terms of, of characterizing or polishing endos in comparison to these genome in a bottle um, true sets. We're starting to use deep polisher now 
as part of our pipeline for the HPRC. We're trying to pull this into our standard practice, and we're also trying to template this as well as the, the genomes I'm talking about today with the pedigrees to make sure we can reach the highest quality of released reference possible. So in addition to building assemblies, which I'm, I'm hoping that we're, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of, of reaching complete, um, highly accurate T2T -T assemblies for the first pedigree, we also have a, a lovely opportunity for the first time to study new genome biology. Um, as I introduced earlier, by having these, we're so used to thinking about pedigrees and thinking about short read mapping areas or genes or areas that are, are typically surveyed by microarrays. But a lot of the regions of our genome that are repetitive cannot be captured in this way. And so this really has a nice opportunity to look into new genome biology. My lab, I guess my whole research program since the beginning, has always had a keen interest and expertise in human centromeres, so this was a natural place for us to start. And here we wanted to ask, you know, what is the inheritance pattern of, of these satellite, these really large tandem arrays that exist in centromeres, as they're inherited between different individuals in this pedigree. And as you think about this, as I did, I want you to think, okay, yes, that means it has to go through meiosis, it has to go through a germline, where the epigenetics and the genetics, you know, goes through this pronuclei stage and, and has to go through development. But there's also a somatic phase that we're looking at when we're studying this as well, because the grandparents are older than the child, and so you have both somatic and you have kind of this um, meiotic stage that you can study in the context of inheritance patterns of these repeats. So not only are we looking at the repeat structures themselves, that when we went into this, I wasn't sure what we were going to get, um, but we're also looking at where the kinetochore sits. I don't know how many people here think about the kinetochore proteins as rapidly as, as our group does, but essentially the kinetochore is the proteinaceous structure that sits on centromeres that's critically important for saying, hey, I'm going to move you to one side during cell division is important for proper chromosome segregation. This protein complex, um, we know, does not take over the entire array. If the array is three megabases, this protein complex can sit on only a fraction of the array. And we really don't know yet where the variation is in terms of where it's sitting on my array versus your array, or even the nature of how that's determined um, as we go through different generations. We spent some time thinking about how to map these areas of kinetochore assembly. Way back with the first T to T X paper, um, there were questions that popped up, and I, I think even Jared might have been on these early conversations of, you know, how do we start to use this emerging T to T um, references to begin to study profiles of methylation. And so this was really lovely that we were able to um, work with Winston Temp's team at the time. Um, and begin to take these nanopore reads, which as I showed on the prior slide, can have the sensitivity of predicting CPG or um, methylation on a base level, but they have the advantage of having very long reads that allow you to map confidently to the satellite or to any um, repetitive parts of our genome. And so here what I'm trying to show you is some beautiful work from Ariel Gershman that was published back in 2022, um, where we're showing uh, one of these satellite arrays. And what your eyes can see is that there's a kind of spike in methylation, kind of a plateauing, and then you reach this kind of dipped region, and it goes on. When we first saw these dipped regions in X, we really did not know what was going on. We had a hypothesis, this is where the kinetochore sat, but it really was pioneering work from Glennis Logston that came out with the T to T8 paper that demonstrated that these sites were correlating with centromere protein A, and then following that, the Gershman paper went through and characterized all of the CDRs across the first complete human genome to show that yes, this is true. And not only that, we not only see it in this very interesting early development um, complete hydrophon mole, but we see it in terminally differentiated LCL lines as well. And since that time, we've been studying CDRs as a community, kind of as a normal feature of human centromeres. So that's why it was striking when we had the first assemblies come through, and I was like, great, well, let's look at the X chromosome. And the X chromosome, we don't even have to worry about phasing. We know the father is going to give the X chromosome to the daughter. And so we have this paternal inheritance of an X array. The X-ray in this case is 2.8 million bases long, and when we, we haven't polished yet, when we generated the alignments between these two arrays, they were 100% identical. And this just floored me, because as I already introduced, we're talking about somatic time, we're talking about LCL transformation, and we're talking about meiosis. So I felt like that 
had to be something crazy <laughs> going on. And we spent um, some time studying this. We've gone through a number of different assemblies now in QCs, but the thing that made me finally believe it is when we're finally looking at the epigenetics, because epigenetics, um, once again, we can trace that by mapping these very long reads along the length of the array. So what I'm trying to show you here are the two arrays that are identical in sequence, but the epigenetic patterns are these centromere dip regions that I'm highlighting for you. Um, using We use a, a, a hidden Markov model to predict these CDR sites. Um, in blue, you can start to see that it has slightly shifted, so they're not in the exact same space. We see this type of exact array inheritance not only across the X, but here's another example that I found incredibly convincing, and that's looking at chromosome 12, where we can monitor the paternally inherited array from chromosome 12 that's inherited now into the mother, and then the mother passes it on to the child, and yet this 3.3 megabase size array is identical in its sequence. And if we do the same exercise I showed you before, and we start to look at the methylation patterns and begin to look at these um, CDR regions, once again, you can begin to highlight some variation that exists across these arrays. So for us, I would say that this is not the trend for all centromeres. Um, we're trying now to go through and, and classify all of the variation that exists as they go through. The challenge here is that we really need to make sure that the variation that we're seeing between two centromeric arrays is real variation and that it's not something that's been induced by some assembly error. Uh, so this has been taking us into a lot of different programs, Verity Map, Nuke Freak, thinking about how to use programs like Flagger to go through and really try to make sure these variants are real. So it's actually <laughs> more fun to tell you when there, there are no variants because that was a very surprising finding, at least for me. Another surprising finding that we had when looking through the pedigrees um, we, we were starting to map these data, we had the advantage of turning on not only um, uh, CPG, but 5-HMC. This is a feature that everyone can have with their ONT data. And when we did, we didn't see anything especially striking throughout the genome, except for these areas where there's classical human satellites 3, where we would start to see this really interesting enrichment over particular classes of satellites. Here I'm trying to show you, we have our kind of SINSAT nom nomenclature on the bottom that I'm not expecting you to know, but I'm using these color indicators so that you can see the red, which was the alpha satellite, and then the dark blue and the light blue, which are two different types of human classical satellite classes that we see in a human genome, where we're starting to start to characterize these really interesting events. Now, if you're thinking this might be some kind of biased event, because of the, perhaps the base color is miscalling it over these satellites which have repetitive structures. We're very curious about this as well. Right now we're going through and doing whole genome amplification and PCR to get rid of modifications and go through and do sequencing um, just to see if it's real. But this is something that we see time and time again and not all HSAT3 arrays have this signature which is the first indication to us that it might be something interesting to pursue. Now I want to emphasize once again that this, we've been talking so much about LCLs or, you know, just normal cell lines that we can maintain in culture. And we've been thinking through, you know, how do they perform or maintain through somatic passages in cell lines. However, because they're properly consented to be into human iPSCs, we now have an opportunity to take this information, these genomes, and begin to ask questions about epigenetic studies in early development and, and, and a pluripotent state, and also as they go through different cellular differentiation. So this has been a lot of fun um, working through to establish these resources with the, in partnership with Coriel and, and WashU. So once again, I'll end my talk by just emphasizing that these are incredibly valuable T to T resources for genome biology. Stay tuned. Um, hopefully in 2024, early, we'll start to make more formal public releases so that everyone in the community can start to evaluate these for themselves. Um, we've been in this talk talking about how to take new technology to improve automation, quality assessment, and in our case, leading to open access T to T genomes. There's a real opportunity by doing this to not only model what the future may be like, where you start to have TDT genomes as more of a standard, but to start to study inheritance patterns of complex regions, such as satellites, subtelomeric telomeres, and even structural variants. And we're pushing in all of these areas now, um, trying to see what we can learn in the corners of these new genomes. And as I emphasized as well, there's a valuable nature here of having these not only in cell lines like LCLs that we can order from Coriol, but actually these human iPSCs so we can begin to expand into new future studies to begin to understand more genome biology. So all the work that I showed you today was really um, a credit to Monica Chukova. She was a project lead and a postdoc in my group, and I really want to emphasize 
um, her first in the acknowledgement slide. We have a number of wonderful collaborators and contributors to this work, bridging a number of expertise in terms of assembly, RDNA specialization, um, and also thinking about StrandSeq that I really want to credit. And of course, um, I don't think I'd be standing here without this wonderful group of individuals at Santa Cruz as part of the Mega Lab, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Karen, for this wonderful talk. We have time for questions. Yes. Karen, that was great. Thanks. When do you think the kinetic core is sliding? You think it's at a homogeneous position in the daughter, homogeneous position in the mother, but between the two of them, it has slid in like germ cell development or something? You know, I don't know. It could be uh, only because we haven't really studied somatic variation. So I think that it, what would be really useful if we, and we do, there's long read data being generated on somatic populations all the time from the same individual. So this seems like a really natural next step to see if this is something that just happens because we're taking blood at different time points and they could be sliding based on the stem cells in the blood that have just over time been moving around. But so one you're, looking at on, you're looking at an ensemble, you're looking at a population average ensemble over the somatic cells, I guess. We are, we are, because yeah. these are all derived from LCLs for the nanopore. Um, what we could do is, I mean, even if we went to blood, it'd be the same, same thing. But in um, early development, I think that was surprising. There's a, you know, kind of an idea when the sperm comes in, you're going to have this reorganization of, of chromatin. And it seems like at least that general position is not moving. It's kind of in position of where it was before. And that's something we're trying to see across the pedigrees if we can make some statement about just the general position as being, you know, through development maintained. And I think that's pretty striking. So, thank you. Questions? Maybe one others are thinking. I start at the very end of your talk. You know, you, you highlighted really the work in, in, in IPSCs, which is also close to my own heart to, to think about this. And I, I wonder, did you already deploy these technologies to discover and look into the novel genetic variants emergence during reprogramming as a function with this improved resolution that these technologies have on offer? For disease, you mean? For dis or even just the process of establishing iPS cell lines from the source tissue, right? And, and I mean, there's a lot of worry whether you, it, you know, might either select variants that are already existing, subclonal, or create de novo ones during reprogramming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in reprogramming, uh, we absolutely cannot trust just the cell lines themselves. And so in that case, we do need to go back and do resequencing. We, we have a budget to support just hi-fi sequencing because we feel like that's enough with the alignments, with the polisher success for doing phasing to get a feel for if we see any kind of structural variants or things that could be wrong. Or, and with that, we have a number of different um, opportunities because that also contains the methylation profiles. And so a lot of our collaborators are, uh, who think deeply about um, pluripotent stem cells like to look at the methylation status of the inactive X chromosome as kind of a marker of, of pluripotency. And so we have a number of different markers like that in the genome so we can begin to stratify these different clones to see which one might be the most um, interesting in terms of, of furthering studies. Thank you. There's a question at the back from Mike. Karen, awesome talk as always. Uh, I'm wondering about deep polisher. Is that hi-fi specific, ONT, Illumina? I mean, that just seems incredibly generally useful. Currently, it is, uh, thank you, um, it's currently only hi-fi specific, and they've trained it on certain deep consensus models. So I understand that there's opportunities now that they can take into training on ONT. I know that they're focused on the R10 ONT model. I don't know if they're going into duplex as being another opportunity for training. Um, I, I know that there's been some interest in thinking about element in particular with some of the polishing work, and so I think your, your question is yes, <laughs> this is where folks are going, but right now the model is only really positioned over one deep consensus versioned model of HiFi. Great, well, thank you all. Maybe one final okay. question. Maybe I hope that some more questions may be still. But <laughs> I just want to, you know, you mentioned the complementarity of these different related nanopore assays that are now coming live, you know, duplex sequencing and others, and that they have different biases and aspects you can utilize. I wonder whether you also see this when you use the long read data to call methylation profiles, mm. which you alluded to at the very end. Are they also complementary there? Is there utility to combine them for epigenome work as well? 
When we first started this, we were looking at the methylation patterns that were present um, genome-wide, and I think that at least these early studies showed that they were trending as expected, which made us feel really great. However, in some of the satellites, we sometimes see an interesting biases in terms of read depth, strandedness, and things like that that have been prior reported. And so that sometimes is out of sync with some of the methylation predictions that we have. And so typically, at least my experience, is that over time, technologies change so fast that this might be something that um, converges quickly. And it might just be that we're just starting to see more and more of these regions to train on and to improve these types of calls in the future. Um, thanks, Karen. Um, so you've been presenting the uh, results from the biases group when uh, you know they would pull multiple individuals and assemble simultaneously. So what are the advantages of that? Like it seems like it's making the you know the task more difficult uh, mm -hmm. versus you can assemble separately then. You yeah, so some of the advantages that we've seen with um, HG002 is just coverage alone makes a huge difference. So that's one advantage that's kind of clear. Another one is that sometimes we're seeing when we look at the grandparents that T to T chromosomes are being assembled, no problem, but then in the child, they're not. And so by combining, then maybe that would be something that we you know we can kind of bypass and template some of that information. So I think that there's um, in that in that direction um, kind of thinking that it might be improved. But this is kind of early days in terms of trying to test out a number of different technologies. Um, this is more of like an overarching question. Could you comment on what the data sharing process is going to look like going forward, especially if we're trying to like comply with ethical standards? Right. And so for this particular cell line, because they are properly consented for open data sharing and use, we would want to try to maintain our data sharing kind of like we've been doing for the other T2T -T projects where we create a GitHub, we maintain the data submissions onto GenBank and SRA. Um, we also typically place them on um, areas like public databases or data sets with AWS so that um, researchers could download them as well. And we try to make ta uh, maintain versioned releases so that um, that's all visible as well, but this is a separate project from the HPRC, <laughs> and so I want to, um, I think that's also a very public use assembly-based database, and in that one we're trying to establish a lot more um, continuity and, and databasing with Anvil and Terra and making Terra databases and making things that are kind of um, accessible to researchers there as well and kind of a, a one hub um, place for folks to go instead of a lot of disparate GitHubs. Right now you can access our data from GitHub and all of these different places too. Thank you. Great. If there are no more questions, I think we should thank Karen again for a really great Thank you. Know.